Yes. Okay, nice. nice. Uh, hi guys. Uh, we won't wait any more longer, so if you have friends coming or uh, anyone else streams in, I guess they will. They will just beep in the middle. Uh, can you guys hear me first, or do I need to use like a mic? Can I? Can hear? Okay, very nice. Okay, so hi. Uh, welcome to Practical Functional Programming. Basically, it's where I sell you functional programming. I'm just kidding. I'm not trying to sell you functional programming, but it's try to um, kind of demystify functional programming a bit, because I think FP is something that's very uh, complex when you first look into it. Okay, so I'll, I'll cover a bit on, on those like myths as well uh, in a bit. So that's a quick about me. I'm Jia Hao. I'm a CS undergraduate uh, in NUS. I'm also a core team member of NUS. Oh, hi, Anna. Oh my god, hi, Jotam. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I think, I think the main, main thing for today is that I'm an Elixir enthusiast. So I've written several articles for Elix, uh, in Elixir. Uh, some of them were published on newsletters. I also did my summer intern uh, at this company called Betafy using Elixir full time for production. And I also did like four years of ad advent of code in Elixir. So um, I really like Elixir. So hopefully I can share this interest with you guys as well. Okay. So um, this is what we'll be mainly talking about today. Uh, we'll be covering quite a few things. Points like one through six we can cover in like 15 minutes. It's, it, those are points that are slightly briefer and we will like touch more upon them as we dive into different parts of this, uh, of like the fundamentals and Phoenix. Uh, okay, yeah, so just as a disclaimer, just in case you are coming in with certain expectations of the talk, um, this talk in particular is supposed to really teach you the fundamentals of functional programming. Okay, so as I mentioned, there are some like myths and stereotypes about functional programming. So this is, so this workshop is trying to break down those myths and, uh, and let you experience functional programming in a more practical manner, right? So hopefully it gives you a new perspective and also kind of lets you apply functional programming in a more practical sense, which is web development, okay? Um, some of the things that the talk doesn't aim to do is mainly trying to convince you that functional programming is the best um, out there, right? I think um, there are many other paradigms that are good, so I think functional programming is just one of them and, they should be, and it should be applied um, more sensibly when necessary, okay? Um, the next two is mainly just as a warning that if you're expecting to go very in-depth into Elixir syntax or go very in-depth into Phoenix, um, I won't be covering every single technical detail. If you're interested, I, um, you, can come, you can come up here and talk to me about it later on. More than happy to talk to you about Elixir syntax and like how it works, but besides that, I won't try to cover every single detail. I'll cover what's necessary. Um, I'll cover what's necessary to kind of get through this talk, get through this workshop and understand more about Elixir and Phoenix. Okay, uh, the last one is also that Elixir is not the only production ready functional programming language. So there's many others. There's like OCaml, which is used by like hrefs and uh, Jane Street. And then there's uh, Haskell, which is also used by Meta for spam detection. So Elixir is just one of the few, but Elixir is also used by companies like Discord. So it has quite a bit of interesting use cases too, which I'll cover later. Okay, so um, just before uh, we start, these are some of the prerequisites. You should have seen them in the guide. So um, in case you need the guide, I'll, I'll flash the screen for the QR code, but this is the guide, and I have included like a bunch of steps for the setup already. So if you don't have it yet, um, please make sure these are set up. So like you can spend a bit of time now setting it up because I technically haven't, like there's a bunch of other like uh, admin slides before we actually start. Um, oh, yes, uh, there's, there's the link here. Yeah. So yeah, so um, we don't ex I don't expect you to have any like very in-depth programming knowledge. I don't expect you to be someone who has like won gold medals in like programming before, but, um, but all you need to do is really understand co core concepts like variables, loops, uh, recursion, and you're probably more than fine to like follow along with the workshop. I think this is quite introductory level, hopefully. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so this is the accompanying guide. There's also a link in the Telegram channel in case you need it. Um, but yeah, I will, I'll just move on. Okay. So uh, before we actually start, can I just get a quick show of hands? Who has actually worked with like functional programming languages before, or like used functional programming paradigms before in the past? Dang. Okay. Okay. So this will be quite an interesting way to introduce you guys to functional programming. Okay. So, uh, in case you have never touched functional programming before, or you have seen code written in functional programming languages, um, these are two of the ways you might have been exposed to it. Right. The first is. 2030s. So if, if you're in comp science or if you're doing uh, like 2030 in, uh, in non-CS, um, you might see something similar where you do list.stream.map.reduce.collect. And, um, and basically, the prof tell you, this is functional programming or this is a style of functional programming. Uh, that's it, right? Um, another way you, have, you know, have seen uh, functional programming is in Haskell. So uh, 
This algorithm basically is just quick sort. It looks very complicated. Don't worry, I won't cover any code that looks like this. Uh, but this is also one of the reasons why people might think functional programming is very difficult because of this kind of like really abstract, really confusing syntax that people uh, think is very hard to approach. Right? So hopefully, I can show you guys that there is a middle ground between a really weirdly simplified version of functional programming and a really complex version. And then there's the middle ground which sits in whatever we are covering today. Okay? So yeah, so the first thing we can do is try to come up with a formal definition of functional programming. Right? So according to Wikipedia, uh, this is like a very paraphrased version, but functional programming is basically a programming paradigm that involves programs, uh, that involves composing programs from functions and treating those functions as first class citizens uh, in the language. So it might seem very confusing. I've kind of italicized some of the words and phrases that are more important in this statement, which is basically everything. <laughs> but um, the first thing we can look at is programming paradigm. Uh, a very easy way to think of it is just a very standard way of thinking about problems in the programming language. Right? So if you're using Java, you would think in terms of objects. If you're using, uh, yeah, so, so a good example, I think, for most people would be Java using objects. Right? So that's object-oriented as a programming paradigm. Okay? Um, the next more, more or less important keyword is composing programs from functions. So in Java, you might create programs using objects. You might create programs using a bunch of classes. And in this case, we just use functions. And functions are basically just methods that don't belong to a class. If, if hopefully that makes sense, but yeah. Um, and then the last one is that we treat it as first class citizens, right? So first class citizen in the language, I think the concept might seem very abstract at first, but the idea is basically just, I can take a function, I can pass it into another function, and basically keep chaining whatever functions I want, right? And I can also return functions from functions. So basically, I can just use them as the same thing as like a variable. I can pass them around. I can use them as it is, OK? So this is a, basically a very simplified version of the explanation I, I just said, right? Basically, all, all it is is an alternative way of thinking about problems and solving them. And just you're using functions as the fundamental building blocks. You're not using objects this time, OK? Um, does anyone? Is anyone lost so far? Just want to make sure. Or everyone's following well. OK? Nice. OK, yeah, so for functional programming, there are five main traits. So like, there is a lot of like, talk in terms of academia on like, what are the specific like, properties of functional programming and, and stuff like that. But um, these are the five main traits that you will see um, as kind of like the cornerstone of any functional programming language. Um, so I will be talking about each of these. Uh, in detail uh, in a bit, but just to give an overview, these are the first five, uh, these are the key five, right? So the first one, I've talked about it. Basically, you can pass functions as arguments, and you can return functions. So this is what is called first class functions, or first class citizens, right? The next is pure functions. Um, it's a bit hard to try to explain in a very con concise manner, but I think the best explanation I could come up with as I was working on this um, was that the only change to the program state would happen with the input and with the output of the function. Anything else, any global variables, any uh, database queries, any prints or whatever, isn't supposed to happen. So the only change that can happen is with the input and the output. So uh, you might think it's a bit very, it's quite restrictive if you design everything this way, because sometimes you might want to do a database query uh, whatsoever. So uh, I will touch about a bit on how Elixir kind of goes against this principle. Um, but basically the idea, or the key idea is that Every time we execute a function, we should guarantee that there should be no changes to anything else besides the input and the output. So it, it, can, it kind of gives you a, 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 a what's the word? Uh, a ease of mind when you're using the function that I'm not randomly changing a global variable. Right? I'm not going to suddenly change id to be two, not id. Then I think id is one, but id is suddenly two because I called the function. Right? So that's kind of the, the idea of a pure function. It's just making sure that there's no other changes that happens in the system or in the program besides the input and the output. Uh, within the function itself, okay? The next trait is recursion. Um, if you guys have done a bit of programming or done like 1010 or 1101, I think you would have touched recursion quite a bit. Um, so I won't cover too deeply into what recursion does or what recursion is. The idea is just most functional programming languages don't use iterative loops. So you don't have like a for loop, you don't have like a while loop. Uh, so instead, you actually just call the functions again and again until you reach some kind of base case. Um, I think for the demonstration, there is no real examples of recursion that it needs to be used. Um, but I will be showing a quick example of recursion written in Elixir. So hopefully that gives a bit of context in terms of how, how recursion can happen. Okay. Um, the second last one is something called referential transparency. Um, the easiest way 
I can try to explain this, is basically a value of a variable doesn't change after it has been initialized. Okay, so the idea is basically, um, this is a quick demonstration. So we declare x as a list, right? So, so this is Elixir syntax. So we declare x as a list. We create a function, right? The function just receives a variable, an input, and it reassigns it to like 4, 5, 6. Um, and we call the function for fn of x below here. And then after that, we want to see what this value of x uh, returns. Um, if you run this code, you actually realize that x remains as 1, 2, 3, right? Basically, no matter what the function did, the original value once initialized of x didn't change. Okay, so if I'm to reassign or if I'm to do something to it, I'll create a new copy of it rather than actually modifying the existing version. So, so that kind of helps with, um, with things like concurrency when you're designing a system that has like multiple threads assess uh, accessing the same variable. Um, having referential transparency is particularly useful because you don't, have, you don't have to worry about a random thread changing the variable and then after that now you're kind of lost in it. Okay, so in case someone, someone here is taking like 3211 or like any like parallel programming algorithm or like classes, you, are, you will realize that like immutability or referential transparency is quite important in trying to mitigate some of like the race conditions. Okay, um, the last one, which I think is something that like a lot of functional programming languages like to like talk about is the type system, which um, in a very layman way is just basically a set of rules to govern what a type can contain. So a very easy example to illustrate this point is, let's just say I'm designing a shape system, right? I want to have a shape. I want shapes can have the width, can have the height, can have the length or whatsoever. So if I write, in, if I write something in, say, let's say Java, I will have to declare it as, oh, there is a float on the, on the length. There's a, it's a float for the width and whatever. Um, but if I look at the function, if I look at the method, uh, method signature, all I'll see is float, float, float. I don't actually know what the floats are doing, right? But if I have a type system like in Elixir or in any functional programming language, you can actually kind of reassign float to actually mean width as well. So a width basically can contain a, uh, a float. And so in this case, it lets you kind of talk about domain-specific problems within the domain itself. So I can talk about the float, which is supposed to represent the width as the width itself, instead of like random float, float, float. Then you don't know what, which of the three floats are the width or the, or the height. Okay, yeah. So these are the five key traits of functional programming. At this point, is anyone lost or, or has any questions about these traits? Or is everyone good here? Uh, for this workshop, I would suggest to think of them as the same. In, in, in general, I think the principle remains the same. I think there are some slight technical differences. Um, I can't give you the exact definition of it because I think it's a bit difficult for me to like, recall from memory. Um, but basically, the, idea, uh, the general idea is just once initialized, variable doesn't, the value of the variable doesn't change. Okay? Yeah, so I will try to get back to you with the, with the formal definition later on. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I've talked so much. Five traits of functional programming, why functional programming, all, the, all that stuff. Um, these are some of the reasons why you could try to consider using functional programming, right? I think the most obvious is that something new, a new method of thinking lets you improve your problem solving, right? If I have to design every single loop as a recursive algorithm, I kind of have to get very good at thinking recursively, right? So that's one of like, the best benefits, I think. Um, there's others like pure functions, referential transparency type systems. Um, but as a hacker, I think uh, there's only one reason that I, I really need and it's really because it's fun. So I think writing functional programming and writing Elixir is more fun. So that's the reason why I use it. Um, you, 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 can, you can justify the decision with these, but my only justification, I, I usually say it's because of this. Okay? Yeah. So now that I've kind of talked about the more abstract level of functional programming, functional programming as a concept, we can actually now introduce Elixir. So uh, Elixir is, oh, that's a very long introduction, brief history, but um, so as a quick brief history, right? Um, Elixir was first created by someone called Jose Valin in 2011, who was like some former Ruby on Rails uh, core contributor. Um, the main idea of Elixir is it's supposed to let you create very well distributed, highly concurrent systems um, very easily, very quickly, right? And it, it does so by com combining two of the properties I've talked about, or one of the property, which is re referential transparency. Uh, the next property is what we call the Erlang virtual machine and OTP. I won't cover these because it's like a whole new other monster in itself. Um, but the idea is that when you combine these two, it lets you kind of create these systems very easily and, and rather painlessly. So, so I, think, I, I think that's one of the draws of Elixir as well. Um, and the syntax, if you have ever used Ruby, you'll be reminded for some of like the, like the function declarations and whatsoever, it reminds you of Ruby. So if you have done Ruby before, you'll be quite at home with, uh, with Elixir too. Okay, 
Yeah, so <coughs> I won't, yeah, so basically the why Elixir part is mainly because I think it's quite a gentle introduction. So it provides, um, it provides all the functionality of a functional programming language, but it doesn't try to bombard you with like functional programming concepts. It doesn't try to make you think in terms of monads or functors or whatsoever. Um, it just introduces you to like the core ideas before it lets you be productive with the language, which I think is great. Um, it's used by companies like Discord, Heroku, Mozilla, uh, and it's also used in quite a few fields like IoT, distributed systems, and web development, which is what we are focusing on today. Okay, yeah. So I have basically managed to cover. Okay, it is 15 minutes, so I've managed to cover these six points, as I said, within around 15 minutes. So now we can actually just dive straight into the fundamentals of Elixir, right? So um, just as a preface, in case I'm going too fast, right? So so this is the website. In case I'm going too fast. Um, basically, whatever I have said so far is basically brain dumped into the website as well. So if you're if you're struggling with understanding a concept, or if you kind of feel like you're falling behind um, in terms of one part of the talk, um, you can just go to the website and refer to like the, the topics that are being mentioned here. And usually, and the guide is a bit more descriptive, and uh, hopefully a bit easier to follow if you couldn't catch whatever I said. Uh, yeah. So so uh, this is just as a point of reference in case. You need like more information, more more details. You can use this website instead. Okay, but I will try to briefly cover these um, these topics as well using the slides too. Okay, so we will cover these fundamentals. Um, technically, we don't really have to spend a super long time on these, mainly because um, these ideas are quite common across other languages. It's just more of taking and translating your understanding of the other languages' concepts into more of an Elixir functional programming style. Um, so hopefully I try to I, I can help to bridge the gap for this, uh, right? And uh, for the last one, mix I won't cover here because I think it's not as important. It's just the build tool, um, but there is more details on the website here. So yeah, so so I, I included a lot more details for that as well. Okay, yeah. So just as a preface, uh, for those who have managed to install Elixir, hopefully all of you did, and you want to follow along, um, you can actually run Elixir code in two ways. The first is using IEX. It's basically the ref, like the repo equivalent. Um, for Elixir, so you can just type IEX into your terminal. You just press enter. You should see this output. Let me see if I can. Yeah. So so if if I just type IEX, you just see this, right? Um, oops. But yeah. Okay. Then the next one, or the next way you can run it is using scripts. You can just create a file with .exs, and then you can run it using Elixir. Um, what I would recommend is just use this method because it's I'm basically just showing like very small code snippets. It's not something super elaborate, super long. Um, but if you want to, you can compile everything right into an EXS file. Completely no issues as well. Okay. All right. So, the going back. So the first thing I'll talk about. Is a, sorry. Sorry. Uh huh. Uh -huh. The shebang. Yes. Uh, no, no, no. So um, if you're writing Elixir scripts, it's basically writing Elixir syntax as a file. And then you're just executing it straight away. So it's not really like a bash script in that sense. It's just Elixir file. Um, I don't know how to explain this, except for, let's see. Uh, uh, let me just make like a uh, sample. Um, uh, just as a demo, let's just say demo.exs. I can just do something like IO puts hello world. So there, there's no need for you to use a shebang, and then you can just write Elixir, and it should run. So, so that's the idea of the script. It's, oh, sorry. Maybe you guys can't see it. Yeah. But, but yeah, so um, all you do is just run the command, R write it out into a file, where it's whichever commands you're seeing, and then you can just run the file. But I think IEX is a lot more convenient, and I use IEX more when I'm in production also. So I think it's a bit more useful if you just use IEX, because script files aren't that, aren't that useful in this case. But, but yeah. Uh, yeah, so going back, the first thing we're talking about is types. So as I said, uh, a core like fundamental of functional programming is the type system. right? So in Elixir, it's a dynamic, dynamically typed language um, that relies on the dia or something they call the dialyzer to provide type checking using type annotations. Um, seems very complex. The idea is just, it's the same thing as like when you write Java and you forget and you write the wrong type or whatever, you call the wrong type. 
uh, it will just throw a warning at you. That's what the dialyzer does. But in this case, it's like an external thing because Elixir is by default dynamically typed. Okay? Um, this is also kind of where like, referential transparency becomes more important because since it's dynamically typed, I don't want to change the type of variables as, as, uh, assigned to and then suddenly everything else breaks because I depend on the variable. Right? Um, yeah, so this is the roadmap. And I know there's a lot of like, lists, but this is the roadmap for the types. Again, it's like 11 things, but I timed myself when I, when I practice this. It takes about like eight minutes to finish. So hopefully it takes about eight minutes here as well. Um, so these are the basic types of Elixir. You have like integer, floats, atoms, and strings. Uh, this should be standard to all of the languages you have seen before, except for atoms, but it should be standard for everything else. So if you have done, Elix uh, if you have done any other language, you should you are somewhat more or less familiar with the types uh, a, langu uh, a language can support. So the way you create a variable is you just put the variable name equals to the type itself, and then Elixir just knows which type it is because of because it's dynamically typed. Okay, um, yeah. The next is arithmetic. You can basically just do normal math in Elixir, which is kind of expected behavior. Um, the most important thing, I guess, is that if you use a single slash for the division, you will perform what is called floating division. So you'll create like the decimal places. So in this case, 3 over 2 is 1.5. Um, if you want to do like integer division, so you want to truncate all of the floating numbers, um, you would actually use div, the div function instead. Okay? And then if you want to find like the remainder, which is like the modulo, you would use REM instead, which is remainder. Okay? So, so this should be quite straightforward. Again, it's very similar to the languages you've used before. It's just plus, minus, divide, uh, uh, multiply, and then some extra functions to help you do other arithmetic. Okay? The next one is Boolean operators. Again, very similar. You have the AND and OR. Um, these are what is known as short circuit operators. Uh, in Java, I believe it will be the same thing as just doing a single AND or a single like OR or pipe operator. Um, but the idea is just the moment I evaluate one side and it's enough information to tell me the output of the entire Boolean, I can stop execution. Right? So the idea would be, for example, uh, let's say if this is true or false instead. So if it's true or false, um, the moment I read a true, I know that the whole, I, I, I will know that the whole, um, the, the whole like expression will become true because it's an or operation. So in that case, I can stop executing after the or. So I can just execute one part, I just execute the other half. Um, this is not particularly useful for the most part, mainly because um, we won't really need to cover, we won't really be exposed to this, but it's just good to know that it's a short circuit operator, right? Uh, is, does, is anyone like lost of what a short circuit operator is, or is everyone like good with this? Okay, um, okay let's go. Um, the next is nil. It's just the absence of a value. It's the same thing as null, basically. So um, this is a bit of like fun fact, which is just nil and false are falsy values. Everything else is a true. So if I'm writing like a statement like if variable, um, then do something. Um, if it's nil or false, it will actually not run the if block, basically. Otherwise, it would run the, the block, right? Um, the next one is a bit more of a unique addition to Elixir. It's something called atoms. Uh, the best explanation I can give for this is that the value of the variable is just the, this thing itself. So the atom is literally just the colon with the word apple. Um, it might not seem useful at first, but it's actually quite useful because, sorry, because we actually use atoms quite a bit um, when we are creating functions. So, for example, if I want to have a function that either succeeds or fails, I can have an atom for success, which is like okay, or I can have an atom for failure, which is like error. And then I can return those two different, um, those two different atoms, and then it can kind of tell me the, the, the status of the function that was being run. Okay? Yeah. Um, I think we will be touching a bit on this in later parts, but I think, let me see, hopefully the documentation is clear on this. Yeah, so, so I, I do try to explain a bit more in depth on what atoms actually do. Um, but, but yeah, this, that's the core idea. Basically, it's just like a constant with like the name of the value. Okay? Um, the next thing is strings. Same thing, standard construct across many languages. Um, you can create a string using the double quotes, right? You can do a string concatenation using like the, the, the open and closing diamond, uh, not diamond, angle brackets. 
uh, and you can also do what is string what is called string interpolation. I won't go into too much details of what string interpolation means or does. The core idea is just whatever is inside this like hash with um, this like hash symbol with like the curly braces, it will be used um, and like used in place of like the final string. So in this case, like string was already declared as hello world. I will basically just use the value of hello world inside here. Um, I think there's another example later, but, but yeah, that's the core idea of, of strings. Again, should be quite standard across many of the languages you've seen. Um, so hopefully you know, like, like it's more intuitive for you as well. Okay. Um, this is just comparisons of types, right? So I can compare one is to one equals to one, or if A is equals to A, or if the atom is equals to the atom, or if one is not two, or one is less than two, right? So it's again quite standard. Um, one of the interesting things is that similar to uh, JavaScript, right? They also have what we call like strict comparisons with like the triple equal sign or the exclamation. Oh, I think I think I wrote it wrongly, but it's the exclamation point with two equal signs, not, not three. So I, I, I typoed that a bit. Um, but these basically make sure that cases like this, the last one, so one equal equals to 1.0 becomes false. Because now um, I don't want an integer to be maybe equivalent to a float, even if the, the integer part is the same, the floating part is the same. Right? So if I want to do something strict in terms of comparison, I can use the triple equal sign instead. OK? Uh, yeah, give me a second. Okay, yeah, so the next part of it is more of the traditional data structures you would see. I think, I think in, the, in the guide it would be like two separate sections, uh, but I just put them all into this, like multiple slides. Um, so the first thing is lists, right? Um, it looks very similar to like if you declare uh, an array in Python, uh, or you're basically declaring an array in like many other languages. Uh, but the core idea is that these are actually linked lists in terms of implementation. Uh, I won't go into depth of what a linked list is in terms of like when you're implementing it. You can just think of it as um, <laughs> I I don't know how to explain this without making it too technical. But basically, you just think of a linked list as it's the same thing as an array. It's just one node points to the other node. Uh, so like high the the high can po will point to one, so it knows what's the next element basically. Um, hopefully, that wasn't a confusing explanation of a linked list. If not, uh, I would recommend just like Googling what a linked list is. I think Google probably does a way better job at explaining it simply. Um, but yeah, so this list in Elixir, by default under implementation, would be linked list. Um, you can create them with different types. So you can have like a, like a string, an integer, a boolean, and then an atom. And it will still create the list, completely no issues. Um, you can do very basic operations like concatenation, which is basically taking two lists, putting them together. Um, and you can also do something called subtraction, which is given a list, I want to remove certain elements. Um, I can also do that using like the minus minus symbol. And then the last one is using length. Length is just a way for you to retrieve the size of the list. Right? Um, the next is called a tuple. So tuples are fixed size and contiguous memory. So technically speaking, these are closer to implementation in terms of like an array compared to the list. Um, but we don't think of these as arrays, we just think of these as Tuple. So if you've done things like Python, it'll be quite intuitive because Python also has uh, like, like tuples with fixed sizes as well. Okay? Um, we can declare tuples using the curly brace syntax. Um, so very similar to how we declare lists, we just put the elements inside, and then that's it. Um, we can access elements of the list, or the tuple, sorry, using the uh, lm function. Right? So it's zero-based index, so if I do like two, it finds like the third number. If I do like one, it finds the second like element instead. So if it returns hello and one, right? Um, and if you want to look for the size of the tuple, you can just use tuple size. Okay? So hopefully both lists and linked lists are a bit uh, intuitive to, to grasp. Uh, yeah, I think the most obvious, if you have worked with linked lists before, is that all the operations that you do on this linked list is O n time. Um, so like if, I'm, if I'm doing concatenation or if I'm doing the length or whatsoever, there is minor compiler optimizations to make it slightly faster. Um, but theoretically, it's always on because it's a linked list by default. Um, tuples, since it's like contiguous memory, you could technically do it in O1. So that's a bit of like the trade-off. If you're designing and you're thinking, what, what should I use? 
Um, but in reality, I would say I usually don't think about it too much. Yeah. Oh yeah, so, okay, so, um, that's a great point. I actually included this in the, in the guide. Basically, I included like a quick section telling you which is recommended, like list versus a tuple, and in here, like this information section, um, there, there, Elixir actually does a bit of compiler optimization. So, as you said, if um, I have a tuple and I'm reassigning it or I'm adding to it, uh, it will create a new tuple, right? So that is supposedly a new block of memory that I have to allocate. Um, but Elixir is kind of smart enough the elements that were from the previous one can remain as the same blocks of elements, and it's only like the new blocks of elements that get like allocated instead. So it's um, it's basically just like a, the way the compiler does an optimization to like save save some of the space um, when you're doing these like tuple operations. Um, if you're interested, you can you can read the the, the guide for this. But I think but, but I think that's a great point. Basically, uh, another consideration I guess is also the space where like contiguous memory means you can't keep allocating stuff, but uh, as I've said, since functional programming is like referential transparency, uh, has ref referential transparency, has referential transparency. Um, every time you create a new instance or you do a certain function to it, a new ins uh, like a new instance of the value gets gets created instead of like modifying the existing one, right? Okay. So so ho hopefully that's clear for everyone. How do you get the third element of value? Uh, there is a function called enum. So I think. I think I've talked about this somewhere. Uh, yeah, so it's this. There is a, there's basically a, met a function from a module called enum.add, and that, that lets you retrieve the element. Uh, so as I said, if it's a linked list, it's still O-N time if I'm retrieving the element, right? Okay, yeah, so, okay, so the next few slides are mainly like applications of slightly more advanced data structures, but I think are still quite useful. Um, I think, yeah. So the first is called a keyword list. It's very useful if you want to like pass options to a function. So an example of this is like the string split. So I'm splitting a string. It's the same thing as like the split function in a split method in uh, in Python or if you're using Java. Um, you notice at the end I can do something like trim is true, right? Basically this has, this just tells. It's, I think it's very similar to Python in this sense, where I can basically specify parameters or additional parameters. With a, with a name to it. So in this case, I'm, I'm saying for this method or for this function, I want to trim any excess white space, right? The trailing and the leading white space. Okay, so um, that's the main application of keyword list, right? The way you declare it is you can just think of it as uh, it's like a basically it's similar to a map where you have like a key, which is an atom, and then you have the value. So this is like the more concise method, this is like synthetic sugar that Elixir gives you. Um, the second line is like what is, how Elixir looks at it even if you write this first one, right? It basically just looks at as a tuple, right? So it's a list. Inside of the list is tuples. And each tuple has an atom as the first, which is the key. And then it has the value that it holds as the second value, uh, as the second part of the tuple, right? Um, so the way you access elements is using um, Basically, like the square brace braces is similar to like when you're accessing values of a map. Okay, um, so these are some of the three properties of a keyword list, right? The first is that you must use atoms for the keys. So I mentioned atoms are like nice ways to to have written values. We can also we also should use atoms as keys as well, right? The next one is that it's order dependent. Um, a good way to imagine order dependence is basically, um, let's say it's A B C. A keyword list of ABC is not the same thing as a keyword list of CBA, for example, if, even if the values are the same. So that's what it means by order dependent. Uh, and the last one is that you can have duplicate keys. So notice here that I can create with two different A's, and they have both have different values. Um, it just so happens that if I have duplicate keys and I do like the access, I will just retrieve the first instance of it. So if I, if I did, um, actually I can just do a demo for it. Uh, A is one. B is two, right? So if, if, if I decided to do like this, it should return only the first instance, even if it's like duplicate keys, okay? Um, yeah, so hopefully a keyword list is straightforward. Um, the main use is just really just passing arguments around, or uh, passing options to a function, okay? 
Um, the next one is a map. So this should be more familiar territory. It's basically just a hash map, right? It just is a key value pairs. Um, it has the same properties as like the traditional hash maps you are used to when you're interacting with another language. Um, you declare them using like the uh, what's this? The per percentage symbol, percentage symbol with like the curly braces. Um, you can declare keys. So the key in this time round can be any any value. It can be a string, it can be a tuple, it can be a uh, a, a number. Um, and then you use like the equal and like basically an arrow to point to the value. Okay, so array uh, hash map access is the same. You can just use like the square braces. Um, you can specify like the specific key that you're using. So in this case, if it's an atom, you use a. If it's like a number, you use two. Um, and you can also do like dot a if it's an atom. So if it's like I can't do dot two, but I can do dot a. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, this top part we don't really need to use it right now. Um, but this is just like nice syntax for updating a map. Um, there are other ways to do it, so I won't really try to dive in too much into this. Um, and as with the keyword list, there are three main properties that we're looking at, right? The first is that anything can be used as a key. So previously, keyword list only can be atoms, now it can be anything. The next one is that the order depend it's not order dependent. So if I have a dictionary, or if I have a map that says A, B, C, and I compare against a map that is C, B, A, both are the same thing, um, as long as like, the values are the same as well, okay? Um, and the last one is that it disallows duplicate keys. This shouldn't be like a surprise if you have done hash maps before. Um, you don't really disallow it. All you do is just you overwrite the values every time you try to like assign it again. So you assign it using like the updating, um, updating syntax. Okay. Um, so I do this point. So I've basically covered all of the types that you need to know for Elixir for now. Does anyone have any like confusion or questions regarding regarding the types? No. Okay. Nice. We are getting getting through it. Okay. So the next one is pattern matching. Uh, I think this is one of the coolest things in Elixir. Basically, the equal sign is not really the assignment operator. It's something called the match operator, right? It tries to match the values on the left-hand side with the values on the right-hand side for an, for an expression. Um, I think the example below is annotated, and it's a, maybe a bit convoluted. I can just explain it. Um, the idea is just x equals to 1, I'm assigning. So this is a regular assignment, right? So I'm creating a variable called x, and I'm assigning the value of 1. The next step is I'm trying to do a pattern match of 1 equals to x. What does this mean? Basically. It just means, given the value on the right-hand side, which is x, can I make it conform to the, uh, how do I describe it? In the, can I basically, does x basically have the same value as 1? So um, there, I have better examples, but basically it just checks if, one, if x is 1. And, right? So the reason why the second one fails is because x is 1, then 2 is 2. So 2 is, two is not equal to 1, so the, the error fails because um, it doesn't match the right-hand side. Um, it might, that, that seems a bit confusing, so I'll, I will just give some examples to make it a bit more clearer. So you can basically apply pattern matching to all of the types that we discussed earlier. <clears throat> so the first one is linked list. So some of you are like, yeah, so the way you can use pattern matching for a linked list is you can just put like, um, so I declare a list called L with like 1 to 6. The next thing I want to do is I want to, uh, I want to get like H. And after that, I do a pipe, and then I do T. So what does H and T stand for? H represents the head of the list. T represents everything else in the list. Okay, so it's the tail of the list. So in this case, if I do this assignment, what you will see is that effectively what this left-hand side did was break down the list that I have into the components that I'm interested in. So in this case, H retrieves. H is assigned to the one. That that T is assigned to the remaining remainder of the list. Okay. So so hopefully. You, get, you, you start seeing the point of pattern matching. It kind of lets you, um, what's the correct word? It kind, it kind of lets you um, interact or use and write syntax that seems there's a bit more um, like, it, so I don't have to like do enum.add zero and then after that I have to figure out another method for tail. I don't have to do that. I can just do it the moment, like when I'm assigning a variable, I can immediately do it. Um, and that's pattern matching effectively, right? Um, the next one is using tuples. I think tuples is a very straightforward example. Basically, if I know the size of the tuple, right, I know A, I have like three elements, I can actually just assign variables to all of those values within the tuple. So it's particularly useful if like, um, if like I have a function that returns a tuple and it has different formats. I can actually just identify what's the correct format and get the components of the tuple. Okay, so I don't have to use uh, the, the alum function anymore. 
Um, the next one is like an ignore operator. It's not really ignoring, but um, it's kind of the same example as like the, the list example, where I kind of don't really need the tail. The tail is kind of useless to me. So in this case, I can just replace it with like the underscore. And that automatically means that um, I will assign A. So I will assign the head, but I don't assign the tail to anything. Right? I will still retrieve the tail, um, but it doesn't need to be assigned to anything else. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So the next one for the data structure is maps. Um, the idea is basically the same as tuple. So I just specify like the format that it came with, and I can put like variable names instead. So I can actually identify in this case like a goes to, like the value of one. So a is assigned to one, and then world var is assigned to like the value of world as well. Um, I think a better example to illustrate this is a really really like more complicated data structure that you have. So in this case, it's like a, a dictionary within a dictionary uh, within a dictionary, or like a map within a map within a map. And uh, what I want to do is effectively retrieve like this value here. So if I want to retrieve the value here, right, I can just basically do pattern matching. right? So I assign again, I ignore the first, first value of the list. I look into the structure of the map. I retrieve, OK, so I know there is a key called B. I want to retrieve this. I know there is like a, another key called nested, and then I assign the, vac the final value of this nested into nested var. Uh, and then so when I call into nested var, I can actually see value. Um, hopefully that wasn't too, too complicated. Uh, we do use this quite a lot in Elixir. I remember writing like quite a complicated pattern matching in the, like, when, when, I was in, when I was interning. So I think it's very useful. It's very, very, very nice to have this kind of syntax so that you don't have to figure out like what's the structure, what are the keys. I have to do like six different calls of like bracket, square bracket, square bracket, square bracket. I think that's this is a lot nicer to deal with as well. Okay, yeah. So that is the end of pattern matching. Does anyone have any like issues or questions regarding pattern matching so far, or is everyone good to go with this? Okay, nice. Okay, so uh, the next one is basically one slide. Uh, it's something called a module. So in Elixir, a module is just a way for you to package functions together. Okay? Um, you will see more of modules later, so I won't talk too much about it. But you can just think of it as I have a module for math, and then I have like functions for like adding, subtracting, dividing, or whatsoever. And I can put them all within the same module. So when I want to call the function, I just call math.add or math.subtract. Okay? Uh, yeah, so the next one is functions, <clears throat> which is like the bulk of Elixir because it's, it's a function programming language. Um, so this is how you declare a function. It's just d, f, def, the function name, the function parameters, do, and then n. I think it's quite standard with um, many other programming languages. It's the same thing for Ruby. So if you've done Ruby, you, you should, you should, this should seem familiar. Uh, I won't go into what def means. It's uh, quite a unique concept. Um, maybe if I have time later or whatever, I, I will find a resource to link to it. Uh, but basically, it's called something called a macro, but I, I won't talk about it too much. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, pure functions can seem very limiting at first, mainly because it forces you to kind of design your, your function to be a way like, oh, I cannot have this side effect, I cannot have that, 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 that behavior, right? Um, but in Elixir, we don't really disallow impure functions, but it's still highly, rec uh, highly recommended. So we discourage impure functions effectively. Okay, so, so you can do things like, um, I think I have an example here. Uh, yeah, so you can do things like side effects, like printing in the function. So yeah, uh, again, I won't try to dive too much into like the, the theory of, where, of function purity, but that's basically the idea. I, the function can basically be designed similar to like how you design like a method in Java, basically. Okay. Um, so for functions, the return value is basically the last line of the function. So if it's a string, it just returns the string. If it's like a number, it returns the number. If it's a tuple, it returns a tuple whatsoever. Okay. Um, so there's no need to use like the return return keyword. There are some quality of life. So you might see this in like my examples. Um, the idea is just if I have no parameters, sorry. So if I have no parameters, so it's empty, and um, it's just one line in the body, I can just remove remove the use of end and then remove the parentheses. So you can write a very really concise function this way. Okay. Um, same thing for like many other languages. You can do like something called function overloading. Just have the same name, different number of parameters. You can do different behaviors. Um, default arguments should be something similar in Python. You can specify one parameter to not be 
to have like take on a specific value the moment you don't give it. So for example, if I have minus a and b, b is defaults to zero. So if I call minus and I don't give the value for b, it automatically goes to zero, right? Uh, yeah, I think I think hopefully this is intuitive for what a default argument is. Uh, but if not, I guess we can do a quick example. Uh, Uh, let's just say it's minus right and then what I want to do is I call minus right if I call 5 and 2 it returns 3 which is expected but if I call 5 alone it should return 5 because B defaults to 0 okay so, so hopefully oops, so hopefully that was clear uh, the next thing is you can do pattern matching on the parameters of your function so whatever examples that you have seen here, like, like the crazy example of like deeply nested structures, you can actually do the same thing for the parameters in your function, which I think is super cool because I can implement Fibonacci using one-liners, basically. I can, I'm pretty sure the Fibonacci is wrong, so like my, my code is a bit wrong, but um, I can basically say if the first argument is the value exactly zero, right, I will return, it's supposed to be zero, but I will return zero. If the first value is one, I will return one. If it's any other value, so n, right, it will basically do the recursive call um, to like fib of n minus 1 and n minus 2. Um, the last one is something you so called like the drop down clause, where if I replace with the, like the ignore operator, I will basically use this function the moment none of these fit. Um, in this case, it won't ever be called because n is like a catch all, anyways. Um, but there are cases where you want to like use the ignore operator to, as like a drop down clause, right? Um, Elixir uses, oh, I can't remember what's the term, but Elixir doesn't have like <coughs> defined like integers are uh, integers and whatever like fixed sizes. So, so it actually can go, like, it can actually support really big numbers. In this case, that it will be a... Are you? Uh, no. So I mean, technically this definition of Fibonacci will terminate. Um, but if it's like a negative number, you will have stack overflow, a stack overflow uh, technically. Because um, you will basically keep calling Fibonacci, but uh, I will explain another way to like prevent these from happening. So hopefully, ho hopefully that can help you. So yeah, it's basically the next slide. It's something called gut clauses, right? It's uh, gut clause is a very nice way to handle cases before you actually run the body. So in this case, um, I have a gut clause on top here where I check if the number is less than zero. So if I call Fibonacci on a number that's less than zero, I should return nil because it shouldn't work. Um, I can also basically combine the first and second functions into one using a gut clause. So I can check if n is 0 and n is 1, I can do 1. I can basically return 1. Um, and then the same function, uh, like the same thing at the end. Another useful case is like if I want to do like an absolute minus, right? Um, if I don't want to use the absolute function for, some, for whatever reason, I can actually just have a and b. I can check when a is less than b, I return b minus a instead. If a is greater than or equals to B, it calls the second one instead. So it just returns A minus B instead. Okay. Uh, do we use this later? We don't, we don't need specifically to use gut clauses later for the hands-on. So I think um, good, to, good to try to understand this. But again, if, if you're uncertain, there is a section, I think, that goes into a lot more detail on how gut clauses work. Okay. Uh, oh, that's quite a lot. Okay, yeah, the, the next one is anonymous function. Uh, as I said, <coughs> Elixir is like a first, it lets functions be first class citizens. So I can create an like, anonymous function to pass around to other functions or to return them. Uh, so basically, I declare them using fn, func uh, fn rather than def, right? And I can use this to pass around into functions or I can call them directly using like the dot syntax. So uh, a quick example would be, for example, if I want to implement minus. Without, without, de without declaring a, a module, I can just do minus a, b, 0, a minus b. Oops. No option. Oops. Sorry. Then I can just call minus um, 5 and 2, and should return 3. So, so basically, that's the idea of like a anonymous function. OK? Uh, if you have done like Java, it would be the same thing as like the lambdas you create using functional interfaces, right? 
Uh, the last one is a, something called a closure. I think if you've done 10.10, you should probably know this as well. Uh, but regardless, the idea is just anonymous functions basically have the value or have access to the variables within the same scope. So in this case, um, the x would have this, would basically take on the value of 42, right? So if, if I choose to call bar somewhere else, I don't call bar now, I call bar somewhere else, it will still use the value 42, and you always return 80, 84, basically. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's the idea of a closure. Um, it's particularly useful for things, for more like functional programming-esque specific things like currying, uh, but in this case, we don't really need to think too hard about it because when you're writing web development, you don't use currying, or at least I didn't, so <laughs> hopefully you don't have to do currying in web development. Uh, okay, so I think this is about like nearly, it's, okay, it's, it's about two-thirds of the way done. There's, there's a bit of other stuff left. Um, for now, does anyone else have any questions up to this point? If not, I think it's about an hour already, so maybe we can have like a five-minute break to go and like go to the toilet, get some water, get like some of the food, and then after that we can continue with like the second half, with the, with the next few, yeah. Why? Oh. <laughs> Of the what, sorry? Uh, what application do we have to approach the programming? Oh, uh, I think I talked about it. Uh, it's here. Where is it? It's here. So, I mean, like, so, so, so typically we use it in like IoT. I mean, we can use it in IoT distributed systems for web development. So, like, this got published an article of how they use Elixir to like scale for like 3 million users or something. And, and, and that's mainly like the way it's being designed. So, I think functional programming in, in, in itself might not be specifically practical to use compared to like object oriented. I think it depends on like the philosophy you're going at. And so maybe the use case. So like what does the language ecosystem support as well? So Elixir in this case is very good for distributed systems. They use Haskell for spam detection and metal. So yeah, so I, th I think in part it's also like which whichever was interesting, people are interested, they will build something like that. Yeah, I feel, I feel like uh, programming is quite interesting for me. Yeah. yeah but I don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah, so, so um, the, the, the second half hopefully talks more. Um, I will try to do like a web application with, with Elixir. So, so hopefully that gives more context to like how you can use functional programming in this sense. Okay. Yeah. But can you make an Elixir compiler in Elixir? Probably you can. <laughs> you can. <laughs> I think yes. Yes. So the times you can, for example, create a timer, circles. Okay. Yeah, you can. That uh, implies a uh, I, I wouldn't call it a circle being an integer, but, but yeah, that, the idea is that basically you can do something like. Uh, uh, I think a good example would be. Let's just go back to the demo. Right, so let's just say I want to define a module shape. Right, and then. Um, I want to create a type, right? So I can just do something called type. I can do like with and then it's uh, integer. So basically this, this means that I, if I have a function, let's say I want to have... Uh, maybe, maybe we can do this as floats. Right, so if I have this and then I want to declare, um, say, area, right? I can do x and y. I can do x times y. Right, it's just declaring a function. But in this case, I can actually do something called, like using the type annotation, I can do spec. I can see area. I can say that this is the width. This is the, uh, this is the length. And then this returns a float. So it kind of lets you talk about the shape in terms of, in terms of a width and a length, not a uh, float and a float. Because if you talk about float and a float, you're very confusing. Uh, so if I uh, remove this line, then you need to write float. Yeah, so, so if, if I remove, if I, oh, shoot. If I basically remove this line and this line, uh, this wouldn't technically the dialyzer would, would show an error, but 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 it won't complain because the dialyzer is like an extra layer. It doesn't actually like stop you from using it. It just, it just tells you by the way you, you're kind of screwing up with the with the typing. But but it's just like a good suggestion to have. Like similar to similar to JavaScript, similar to TypeScript. Types are optional. Annotation. Yeah, types are optional. Types are entirely optional. It's dynamically typed. Yeah. But but the good thing is it's very seamless to kind of write it, write types. So it's it's less of a hassle. Compared to like if <coughs> compared to like um, maybe TypeScript if I have to go and 
de like declare like an interface just to create a, a, map, a, a map and everything. So it's less restrictive in that case. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I feel like there's a lot of content. <laughs> I, I might have might have put a bit too much, <laughs> but it's okay. We'll get through it. Okay, actually, not not that much, not that much left. Not that much left. Let's go. Are you are you enjoying it, Tim? Oh, yes. So I asked about Stack Overflow. Oh yes. Because in other uh, other functional programming languages, I've seen like telco optimization. Oh yes, yes. Okay, so, so only when it's the last call would it be optimized. Yeah, yeah. So Elixir Elixir does implement uh tail call optimization as well. So I I guess technically the answer to your question is no, there wouldn't be a Stack Overflow if it's Fibonacci. Right. Um, technically, if I designed it slightly differently, if it wasn't a tail call, it, it could stack overflow regardless. So, so it, it depends on the. So my question is. It depends on the function. Your example. My example won't stack overflow in that case. And it will go infinitely, lah. Cause, cause it, if it's a negative number, it, it keeps running. No, I mean a positive number. But positive number. Won't. But there's two function calls. And then it won't. It won't. Because, because it's tail call optimization. So, so, so it uses tail call. Optimization. It does. It does tail call. CTS. Uh, not too sure how it, how exactly they my do understanding in the other language. Right. I think this is not tail call because uh, the tail is the plus sign instead of the function. Function should wrap. The return value is purely a function. No, no. I think I it gets optimized. Right? It's, it yeah, gets it optimized. Gets I don't I don't particularly know how it gets optimized. I just I just know it doesn't it doesn't like like spoil the moment the number is moving. That I guess that's the point. Yeah, yeah it's it's. It's a bit hard because I, di I didn't actually like dig specifically into like the, the recursive of compiler part. Yes, hello. Oh, yeah, pattern matching, yes. What, what about it? Are we like reading the value from inside the yes. thing into the. So we are reading. So pattern matching works by reading the values of the. Of the right hand side into the left hand side. So the reason why this works is because n has this structure. So all I'm doing is basically matching. I don't. I'm saying I don't want the first value. I skip. I'm looking at the next value, the second value, which is this. I'm looking. Okay, this map has p of b. So so you notice that it can actually be out of order because I said maps can be. It's not order dependent, so it can be out of order. So I can put b first, right? Because I'm interested in b. I'm not interested in hello. So I can get b. I can get nested, I can go into the nested and then I retrieve the value. And so this value is mapped into whatever is stored here. So it goes into the nested value here. Yeah, so, so, so that's how pattern match. I think, um, uh, let's, see, let's see if I have a good example on this. Uh, I think I have, have a good example on... Uh, demo, would it, would it be web? I, I cannot remember my, my own files, but uh, yeah. So, so yeah. So so in this case, I think a good example would be this, right? So um, it's a function call. I'm calling. Um, I can be any any event, but in this case, I choose to call the event add to do. So I can match specifically for the add to do. I can use this function. If it's like mark to do, I'll use this function instead, right? So that's one part of pattern matching. The second part is if this is like a map as an argument, I can actually retrieve the specific value of the map without having to assign it as a value, then do a, then do a like a bracket ID, then like, then like imagine if I have like six levels down, I don't, I don't have to like, I don't have to like write all of those down. So like, this is a very nice way to do it. Um, in my intern, during my intern, I wrote like a, like a four or five deep in like nested thing before. So I think that, that's one of the reasons why I think it's super useful to like pattern matching, because I don't want to, Bracket this, bracket, 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 then like finally get the value. Then if the value is not there, then I kind of like like all one of the values are not there. I, I basically my 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 thing was crashed. Right, but then nested nested yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So so regardless, it's not recommended. But the thing is, um, because you have pattern matching, it's very easy to 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 recover it if you need to. And and I think in general for like Unix, you will use these kinds of syntax quite occasionally. Cause cause. This is basically telling me like the parameters I'm returning from, from front end to back end. So if, if I return this, I need to know specifically what's the ID. I so I can assign a completely different name also. If it's ID, I can still call it task ID. Right? I can call it whatever I want because it's just a variable name. Right? Yeah, it's, it's Phoenix. It's called Sidro. So um, it's quite interesting. Uh, I won't really try to go too much, but basically, 
you can you can basically declare like custom strings in a sense. So the way I process this string is I process it as HTML. I don't actually process it as like a regular string. So like this are one of the things that I won't actually cover during this workshop because it's way too way too technical. But it's one of like the cool things that other languages can do. Like there's a, there's a lot of other things like macros or so. Like, like for example, this use basically just says that this entire class has a bunch of like additional functions that you don't see. It's basically like inheritance, but slightly slightly cooler. Okay, but but yeah, uh, I think it's around ten minutes already. So I'll I'll try to resume. Then I'll, I'll I'll get to these examples like as I'm going through. So hopefully I have enough time. But I love I love the interest. <laughs> I love the interest. JSP? Oh, kind of. It's a preprocessor, right? Uh, yeah, not really a preprocessor. Uh, I have an article about macros, like four, four articles. I, I'll, I'll, I'll include it in the link later. But, but yeah. Sorry? Common com no, it is the same thing as common list macros. No, it is common list macros. Macro systems and the was inspired by this macro systems. It's a it's a it's a it's a class of it's a class of macro systems called ma macro meta programming. Yeah. So 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 list uses it, Elixir follows it. Okay, cool. Uh, hi guys. Uh, we'll be starting now, basically. So ho hopefully you managed to get some food. Um, but I will just cover the last. Two, the last two of fundamentals of Elixir, and then we can finally do something a bit more interesting with some coding, which is talking about web development with Elixir. So hopefully, I didn't bore you guys in the first half. Um, I think that I, I I promise the second half is probably a bit more interesting because you are finally using Elixir for something productive. Okay. Um, so the next thing we are talking about is again common constructs you will see in other languages this time around, just in the context of Elixir, which is conditionals. Um, I won't cover what if and unless does, because I think everyone, OK, so if is quite intuitive, unless just the opposite of if. So I won't really go too in-depth into it for the sake of time. Um, but the first thing is case. Case is basically like a switch statement, but slightly more powerful because you can use pattern matching with it. So in this case, I want to take a given value case, so one, two, three, and I want to check which of the clauses match it. Um, and Unlike switch statements, I can actually use pattern matching. So I can actually assign the value of x uh, in here. So it won't pass the first case because it's 1, 2, 5. This is 1, 2, 3. It doesn't work. 4, 5, 6. It's not 1, 2, 3. It won't work. When it comes down to 1, x, and 3, um, this will actually pass. And then x becomes assigned to 2 instead. So, so that's one of like, the more handy parts uh, of Elixir. Uh, and what we have at the bottom is the same thing as like, our default case in functions, which is we use like, the ignore operator. And we effectively, this is like the default case in a switch statement. So like if all of these don't work, this last one will work. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the next thing is something called a pin operator. We won't use it in, uh, in for, for today. But the idea is just previously, if I do one x three, x becomes two. So x takes on the value of whatever it matched. Um, but in sometimes I don't actually want x to take on the value. I want x to be a specific value I'm comparing against. So in this case, if I use pin to x. I expect, I, this becomes effectively 1, 2, and 5, and it compares. Um, oh, yes, there's a missing comma. Sorry, I, I did the slides like yesterday. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so great question. Yeah, so, so there is a missing comma here, so there should be a comma. It's basically the same syntax as a tuple, but uh, in this case, I'm just saying I'm using x value, x must be 5, right? I'm using whatever x value was on top. I'm not reassigning x. Okay? Uh, the next one is if. So if is the same thing, it's just that there is no like else if clause. So if I want to have like else if x less than 0, I would actually have to do nested. So this might look very messy. That's why case exists. Wait, wait. Oh, sorry. Condition exists. So it should be con C O N D, con. Um, but condition is basically just converting these kind of statements into like uh, basically no arrow hits, right? It's not an arrow hit style. It's not like nested in words like this. It's actually just line by line. Each condition will run. So x greater than three, it, run, it returns greater. If x is less than zero, it returns negative. If so, true is the same thing as the underscore. But since condition basically checks if this is true, um, true is just our default case in this sense. So we'll just have true. So for anything else, we just say it's lesser. Um, basically, this is the same thing as this, right? So uh, hopefully, this is straightforward. If you compare like these two functions next to each other, um, I do think. Uh, sorry? Can I do a series of error checking in accounts so that I don't have to give error if error? 
error checking condition. What do you mean? Sorry. So like uh, several error conditions hit first, and then the. Oh yes, yes, can. Yeah, yeah. So um, conditions. Uh, I won't guarantee this is how the compiler looks at it, but traditionally you would write like the error cases or the cases you want to hit first on top, then you just slowly write it down to like the true case at the bottom. Because true is, you can think of it as like the drop down case. So everything else fails, true should be the one that passes. Right, so yeah, I think that's quite a valid concern. You can actually use um, guard clauses with this as well. So um, basically this is where like functional programming goes a bit crazy with like combining all of the concepts. So like this when and stuff, you can actually put them together with like case two. So you, you, you can actually make it even more like complex with whatever case you're writing. Um, it's not necessary to exp like, like go into depth about, uh, about this for this workshop, so I won't really try to hover too much about it. Okay, uh, but hopefully uh, the conditionals are straightforward. Uh, unless it's basically the opposite of the if. So if the condition must be true, unless the condition must be false before it can run. Okay, uh, yeah, so the last one is quite interesting. Is there, okay, so there are two statements. This is a, a bit of one, two, three, one for fun. Uh, so the first statement is that expressions can be returned. The second statement is conditions. Conditionals are expressions. Um, therefore, conditionals can be returned. So I can actually just return a conditional like this. So I can return the value of this is returned or this isn't. Um, I can also do assignments with the conditions because they are basically just expressions. Right? So, so that's quite a handy tool to have. Um, yeah, I, I have written quite a few of these kind of conditionals before, so I think these are quite practical as well um, in terms of like returning and using conditionals in a more uh, concise manner, if you will. I, th I think I did talk about... Oh, shoot, I, th I, I think I might have closed... I closed Firefox, but... Okay, but basically the idea is I did include some more examples on, um, on returning conditionals and um, how we can like, make conditionals more compact, but I won't cover them in, the, uh, in here. Everything is on the guide. Okay, um... The next one is recursion. So as mentioned, or as asked by earlier some, by someone, um, Elixir uses what we call tail call optimization. Again, this is like a very com science term. I won't really try to cover too, too deep into it. The, I guess the key takeaway um, is it basically lets you run recur recursion in the same way that you might run iteration. So like the space complexity, because when you run recursion, sometimes you create more like space because of the stacks, stack frames. In this case, recursion for Elixir um, under certain circumstances, won't actually do the same, so it will actually perform the same as like an iterative algorithm. So you don't have to worry about like, oh, if I'm writing a recursive function, will it be more expensive or whatever, or like in terms of performance. Um, more or less, that, that really isn't a major concern because of tail call optimization. Okay. Um, the next few slides are just more of like demonstrations on how you would convert like recursion, how, how we convert like an iterative loop to a recursive function. I think. Um, I think a pretty good example, I guess, is the first one, is the mapping. So in mapping, I have an original list. I want to create a new list or modify the existing list with certain changes to the values, like transformations. So in, in, in Python, it will look like this. Uh, in Elixir, we can combine things like pattern matching. We can combine things like gut clauses or whatever um, to actually create a very concise method for mapping. So the first thing is basically, if I find like an empty list, I can return whatever I've accumulated the result. Um, otherwise, I will do like the head and tail operation that we saw earlier. So I'll retrieve the head, which is, which is what I call xi. Then after that, the tail of the list is the remainder rest. Um, and I basically just call, recursively call it rest with like the result. Then I append um, the, trans sorry, the transform and the mapped value towards the end of the result. So basically all we do is we take the current list, we keep shrinking it down to, till the list is empty. And as we are shrinking it, we create like a new list with the mapped values over. So it's effectively the same as this, uh, slightly different, um, but the concept is the same. Uh, I have more examples on the guide and also in the slides. So just in case you guys are interested, uh, you can take a bit of more time to dissect this. Uh, yeah. Okay, so the last one, I believe, last? Okay, last. The last part is enumerables. Uh, we will use enumerables a bit later, but the key focus is basically it's the same thing as like your list class in Java where you have a bunch of like helper methods or helper fun uh, to like perform actions for you that you would otherwise have to typically do like with a bunch of recursion or a bunch of loops. Okay, so um, some of the basic ones is like all making sure every element satisfies a certain condition, any as long as one satisfies, add to find the element, like filter, map, and then reduce, okay? 
Uh, a slightly more useful application of, uh, of enumerables, I guess, is the pipe operator. Basically, uh, if you're writing like, if you're used to writing like Java code, you might actually see something like this. So like you might do like a, um, so okay, so the way to read it is you start from the inside. So you start with one to 10. So from values of one to 10, right? I want to filter all integers what, that are odd. After that, I want to then use this odd list and then map the values and double it. So if you read it right now, it looks very confusing um, because it is very confusing. It's very nested. Um, Elixir does a very nice thing, which is it uses a pipe operator to actually pass the output of a function into as the input of another. So what it effectively lets you do is it converts this really, really long, really, really unyieldy one-liner into this. So the way you can read it, very simple. 1 to 10, I pass it into the filter function as the first parameter. The second parameter is still the same thing. I find all the odd numbers. The result of this, which is another list because it's filter, I put it through into the next, uh, next function, which is map. And then map, I just double the numbers, the odd numbers, basically. So it, it kind of lets you read these kinds of like function chains uh, in a more like standard method rather than like you have to go all the way inside then you have to slowly expand outwards. I think that's a bit, a bit less intuitive. Okay, uh, hopefully this is clear for how function chaining works. I think these are, these are, these are kind of things that um, as, you play along, as you play around with writing Elixir, you will usually get a bit, a bit of a better hang for this. But yeah, okay. So finally, in about the hour, one hour mark, we have managed to complete all of the Alexa fundamentals. But now we are going to look at Phoenix because this is not just like a tutorial on Alexa. This is also kind of trying to give a practical application of Alexa um, in more modern or common applications of programming. So, like, so I, th I think someone also asked what are some of the more common applications of like functional programming. So this is one of them. You can actually use it for uh, web development. So it is done using something called the uh, Phoenix framework. So this is just a quick overview. It's just a server-side web framework. Um, server-side just means everything is done on the server. It computes. It returns some kind of HTML. The client just has to print, like show the HTML. Okay. Um, it was created by this guy called Chris McCord. He's quite famous in Elixir. But he was also um, someone who was very interested in Ruby on Rails. So he actually modeled Phoenix a lot on Ruby on Rails as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. And it uses what we call the model view controller pattern. Uh, this is a bit of like a software engineer theory thingy, but um, the core idea is you kind of separate your, your, your system into three parts, right? You have the model, which is your data. You have the view, which is like whatever the, the person sees. And then you have controller, which is basically how your user gives instructions to the system. So uh, I kind of created this diagram, quite cute. <laughs> but you can, this, this is basically like the cycle of how MVC looks like, okay? Uh, yeah, so for today, we will try to implement like a really simple to-do list. I, because of the lack of time, I won't try to like minutely look at every single detail and explain every single detail as I go. So um, again, if you are stuck or if you're feeling lost, you can refer to the guide as well. I will just try to give a demonstration of how intuitive it is to create uh, applications with Elixir and Phoenix, okay? Uh, so yeah, so again, I, I really like my, my, my task list. So we have the structure of, of the, this section of, of today. Um, the first few again, like the first one, two, three, the first five are quite straightforward. It's the remaining like, like, like this last two are the more important ones. The last one I can't, I won't cover today, uh, mainly because it's a, like an extension of whatever we are using. Um, but again, the guide covers it. So again, refer to it if necessary. Okay. Um, yeah. So to get started. Okay. So, so now this is where like you guys can open up your terminals and do something. So finally, it's not just listening to me talk. Um, the first thing you want to do is you can actually install the Phoenix CLI using this command. It's also on the guide, so if, if I move past the slide and, you're, and you haven't done it yet, uh, you can do it now. Um, then you kind of create a new project using this command, and after you can go to the project. So I, I won't... Uh, okay, let's see. Okay, so, so, so the first thing you want to do is you want to basically just do um, the archive install this. Right, so you just run this command. Uh, I have everything, so I don't have to reinstall it. But you'll just press yes, and then you will install it, right? Uh, then the next thing you want to do is to create a new application. So you'll do phx.new, practical elixir demo, or like whatever name you want to call it. And then at the end, we just use dash dash database SQLite 3. Um, the reason why we use SQLite 3 is just because it's a lot less set up for you. Because if you use Postgres or MySQL, uh, you might have a bit of problems with like making, making the server run. So just for the sake of like, Simplicity, we'll use SQLite 3. 
Okay, so um, I'll also do it live. So if you, if you press, you'll see a bunch of text come out. You can just press yes, and you let it install and do the setup. Okay? Okay, yeah. Um, so once you navigate, the next thing you want to do is uh, call this ecto.create. Um, and then the last one is to run the server. So hopefully this runs fast enough. Um, but you should see this once you're done uh, with, with that. Okay, so, so I'm done. So I'll change into the folder, right? I will do a ecto.create, right? So, so this is basically setting up the database. It should be quite fast because I'm using SQLite 3, so no weird Postgres calls or whatsoever. Um, and then the last one is to run the server, which is dot uh, phx.server, right? Um, it says database log. You can just, if it says database log, you can just stop and run again. It will, it will fix itself. I, I, I don't know what, like, there's like a weird, weird issue with it. Okay, cool. I'm finally back. Yeah, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, so, again, the instructions are here. And we can actually just navigate to the local host to actually see this in action. So you actually should see that this is the first page you see, right? So quite cool. We have functional programming, something that you might think is very abstract or something that's very academic. You can actually create a website. So now we are trying to create our to-do list, okay? So the first part is to talk about the directory structure. So uh, for the sake of everyone here, so that you don't have to see me writing in Vim, uh, I will just open it in VS Code. Uh, yeah, so I've opened it in VS Code, right? Uh, if, if you're interested in the command, it's just code, dot, code with like the dot. Um, so I, I, we can talk about the folder structure in here. Okay, uh, again, there is more in-depth explanations on what the folder structure and what each folder does. Here, right? I give very specific instructions. Um, but just to give a brief overview, the folders that we are interested in for, for today, at the very least, is lib, lib, right? Lib is basically the source, like every file that we actually need for creating the website for the logic and everything goes into, goes into lib, lib. Um, the next thing we have is priv. Priv is basically any file that is necessary to your project, but doesn't really fit into like the Elixir code, so we can go into here. So things like your SQL files under repo, your migration files, um, any static assets that you might have, like images, you can have them all here, okay? Um, there's another thing called mix.exs. If you have done things like Java with Gradle, it will be very familiar because this is the same thing as the build.gradle file. If you have done Maven, you will be like the maven.pomo file. Basically, it's just like package.json. It's just the build file. We won't touch this for this for today, so don't worry about, about like the details on this. Right? Um, then you have the, the database file for SQLite and some configs. Right? Um, the configs, again, not as important for today. I, I did explain a bit more on like how you can interpret the configuration. So if you're interested, do go and read this as well. Um, but again, to save a bit of time, I won't dive too much into it. I will just try to explain the files and folders that we need as we are going through this. Okay? Cool. So let's see. So in basic or base Phoenix, we use what is the basic like HTTP request lifecycle. So I've drawn a quite a like, quite a cute diagram. The, the person quite cute, but uh, <laughs> but basically the the main idea for this is there is the user, the client, the server, and our database, right? The user performs some action to the client. The client sends what is called like a HTTP request to the server. The server then like fetches information from the database or does any processing. It returns the information to the server. The server prepares some kind of response. It sends it back to the client, and the client renders this result of the action. Okay, so if you have done any web development, this should be quite standard. It should be quite intuitive, or at least very familiar for you. Um, but if it, does does anyone have like any problems with understanding like the general flow for this first? If not, if all good, then okay, nice. Okay, so uh, a bit more on HTTP, right? Uh, it's basically just a protocol to do requests and response. You have on the left hand side you have what we call verbs. It's like get, post, put, and delete. These are basically actions that will happen. Uh, and then you have the endpoint, which is like slash to do or slash names or slash user, right? It's basically just a way for you. It's like uh, it tells you where the resource is located. Okay, um, yeah. So the first thing we want to do is basically represent 
our to-do items. Okay, so, so now we are basically starting the coding part already. Yeah? So we are basically want to think of how we can represent these to-do items in Elixir, right? So this is basically something new. Um, I have not explained this before, but um, basically we'll be using what we call structs. So if you have done things like C, uh, C programming, if you have done things like Golang, uh, I, don't, I don't know if C++ has this, I don't use C++, or if you have done like Rust, structs should be quite familiar to you. Basically, it's something like a class. You have like names and you have give it attribute uh, values. Uh, but like in terms of implementation, I believe it's not exactly the same. So I'll probably get burnt at the stake if I say they're the same thing, so they're not the same. Um, but yeah, so the first thing I want to do is think of how we can represent a to-do item as a struct. Oh, uh, sorry, and in Elixir. So the first thing I want to do is we can use a struct. Okay, so um, if you are interested in writing it, <clears throat> you can find like the full description, full steps, and full instructions all in uh, all in on the guide here. So just in case you can't uh, follow exactly. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is we can go over to lib practical like the. Okay. So you will see that there is actually two folders here, right? Uh, let me let me increase the font size too. Uh, you know, I'll do it later. But you can see there's two folders, right? There is the one for demo, and then there's one for demo underscore web. So the, the way we can interpret this is the first folder, the one without underscore web, is used for all the front end, the client stuff. Eh, sorry, the back end, all the processing, the server logic. Then the underscore web is the one that is, has all the client logic, right? The pages, the views, the templates, everything that is rendered to the page. Okay? So that's the key separation that we have. All right? So because the representation for a to do item is usually in the back end, we will add it to the first folder. We don't add it to the second folder, we add it to the first folder, okay? So the first thing I want to do is I will right click, I'll create a new, uh, sorry, a new folder, and we can call this to do, okay? So you can just think of the folder, uh, like the folders don't really matter, like the, the path and the specific folders and subfolders don't matter in Elixir. It really matters like the, the package and the module that you're using. Um, I won't go into much into detail about it, but the TLDR is just, Creating or not creating the to-do folder doesn't really matter. It's just more so like for your sanity, you don't have like 100 files in the same folder. You have a bit of organization, okay? So once you created to-do, we can create a new file. We can create, we can call it to-do item.ex, okay? So the next thing I want to do is we want to create a representation for this. Okay, sorry. So, uh, can you all see my screen or do I have to increase my... Okay, I'll, I'll increase it. Uh... Let me put this to 16. Hopefully it's large enough. Is it large enough? I'll do 18. Okay, it should be large enough. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is define a module. Right? So we'll do practical Elixir demo, which is the basically like the parent module that we created, right? As, as I said, the modules are like logical ways to, to group your functions. So in this case, practical Elixir demo is grouping all of my backend, my server logic. I do dot because I can have like basically like nested packages effectively. And I'm going to call this to do item. Okay? And then I can create the module. Then after that, I want to do what is known as creating a struct. So as I've said, a struct basically has a bunch of keys or attributes, and then you have an associated value. So let's just do that in here. I will have a key or a value for title. I have a value for description, and I can specify default values using, like if I, re if I change it from an atom to like a key value, a keyword list format, we can actually specify default values. And then the last one is we can specify like is done, and then we can say false, right? So also notice that in Elixir, we can actually use question mark in our, a question mark and also exclamation point, but we can use those in our variable names, okay? So uh, this is a way we can, we can do to represent our to-do item right, in the back end. If you're using like databases, you would, you, this would be like the database object. Uh, but in our case, uh, we are using just in memory as the program is running. So just write it as, as a struct instead, okay? Uh, the next thing I want to do is do what is called derive and JSON encoder. Um, this is basically using a module attribute. I didn't cover this because it's, it's a bit of like advanced Elixir. Uh, but basically you can think of it as kind of like, uh, as like inheriting from an interface. And then the interface specifies certain behavior that, is, that happens. So in this case, we want to derive JSON encoder. Uh, and the only reason why we do this is just so we can convert this struct format into a JSON object when we are doing like returning from the API. Okay? 
Okay, so, so far, ha is everyone able to like understand and follow, or is anyone like lost already? Jason is the library. Jason is the Jason is the name of the library, la, So. Sorry. Oh, oh, yes. Okay, comments is this. Comments is the, is the is the hash symbol, by the way. So in in, in case in case you want to write a comment, you can write hi. This is a comment. Okay. Cool. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is to talk about the anatomy of our router. Okay, so we have kind of created our representation of our, uh, of our, of our to-do item. The next thing we want to do is basically create pages, create endpoints with this representation. So to find your router, is you can go to the second folder, the one with the underscore web, and we can go and find something called router.ex. Right, so if you open it, you'll see a lot of text. Um, it seems very intimidating, but the core structure is discussed here. So I, I, I break down the three main components, um, but I will briefly cover them here. Right, so there's four, p four key parts. The first is the use expression on top here. All it does is it tells Phoenix, this is the router that I'm using, okay? You don't have to, you don't have to care too much about what it actually does under the hood yet. All you need to know is that it just tells Phoenix this is the router file, okay? The next section, which is this pipeline things, is basically just a way for you to declare like, sequentially, these are certain actions that will happen. So like, um, you're saying that a browser would have accept, it accepts HTML, you will fetch the data session, you will fetch any live information. Uh, this is for live view for later. You will include a certain root layout, and then you do certain other things. So. Um, again, pipelines aren't really important to understand for now, but the key idea is just, you can think of it as a literal pipeline, so whenever you call a route, it will go through the pipeline before you actually call the actual route, right? So all of these has to happen before you actually can call the route, or if you're returning a value, all of that return value must also go out through the pipeline as well, okay? Um, the last part, which is the part that's a bit more interesting and a bit more important for us, is scope. If you have done any like web development, like if you have used Spring Boot, or if you have used Nest.js, or if you have used, uh, uh, what's, what's the other one? Uh, Jin in Golang, for example. This should seem quite familiar. Basically, all you're doing is just grouping all of the routes with the same like parent route together. So in this case, I'm grouping all of the routes under slash. So you'll see here that the default route is like getting the page controller, which is actually how we get this page. Right, it's basically just retrieving this. So I will talk a bit more on how to do this, like what these mean. Uh, but that's the main anatomy of our router. Okay? Okay, so uh, I won't... Okay, so I think for the sake of our time, I won't cover creating an endpoint because we won't actually use the endpoint. It's just more of like an uh, like illustration of how the router works. We can, we can achieve the same thing using creating a page. Okay, so I'll just dive straight into creating a page. All right, so the first thing, uh, I laid out quite simple steps to kind of illustrate that it is very simple. Um, the first step is to create a route in the scope for router.ex. The second is to create a controller action to render our view. And then the last one is to create a template file to render the page, okay? So the first thing I want to do is under the scope here, right, we want to create another get slash to do. Let me call it page controller and then I'm calling, gonna call it to do. Okay, so this is basically achieving the first step. Uh, let me just say new, right? So I'm a, I've achieved the first step already. Very straightforward. I just created a new route. The next thing I wanna do is create the associated controller action to render our view. So if you go under the, the underscore web folder, you'll actually see there's a controllers folder and you'll see like other files. The one we're interested in is page controller because it corresponds directly to this controller that we declared here, right? Um, you will see that there is a, we, we call the atom for home. Basically, this maps to the function name. So uh, a big part of Elixir is we can basically do a lot of like weird, intuitive references to functions using atoms rather than using like the function itself or like the actual module or whatsoever. So this is one of the nice and handy ways we can use Elixir for. So, what this sentence effectively says is, whenever the person goes to the slash to do page, 
I will look at the page controller, right? The controller is here. And I'll look for uh, the action, the action being to do. Action is the one that basically says, how do you handle the page, OK? So in this case, since we declare we have an action for to do, we have to create a function for to do. The function should, re should receive two things. It should receive a connection and the parameters. In this case, we can ignore the parameter because we don't actually pass any parameters to the back end. Um, we can actually copy what, whatever we did above, but we can actually just say render connection to do. Layout is false. And just for the sake of um, just for the sake of our data, right? Let's just say I want to create a pre-given list of to-do items. Right? So in this case, we can actually do something like practical elixir demo to do item. First item. Description should be first. And then maybe we have a second item. Uh, second item. And we can remove the description to like kind of demonstrate how the default values work. Okay? So uh, I'll, I'll put this into new lines so it's a bit more easy to read. But this is kind of where we use our keyword list, right? So you see. After we've declared render, we put connection, we put to do. Now we declare keywords, right? We say we want no layout, right? So we de disable the default layout because we want to create our own custom styles and whatever. And after that, we want to create a to do list or we want to give the page an initial to do list with two items inside of it. Okay? Um, I think in the guide, I did a slightly different way of creating the demo items. I created like a new module for it, but it's the same thing. Uh, I just created like, small abstractions for it for the ecto part. OK? So uh, is, is anyone lost at this point? Or, or is everyone like under, understanding whatever's going on so far? OK, nice. OK, so the next thing is notice that we again call this to do. So what exactly are we doing? What we are doing is basically saying that we can go back to the router. When we go to the slash to do file, or the, the endpoint, the page, we go to the page controller. We look at the to-do action, and with the to-do action, I want to choose to render a page, right? So render is rendering a page, but which page exactly do you want to render? That's where this new to-do comes in. It basically specifies what is the file that's supposed to be rendering the content, OK? So now let's create the file to render the content. Under the controllers folder again, you can go under page HTML. You can create a new file called to-do html dot h e e x so it's to do dot html it's it's just this to do dot html dot h e e x and make make uh make sure it's a dot not a not like an underscore or whatever right so so these are like the parts of the of, of the page okay so basically what you have done is in my to do action i'm saying i want to render a page the page will be called to do and i basically created the same the same file here Right, so this is the page that we rendered. So if we want to run it now, right, and I go to slash to do here, you see it's a blank page, which is correct because because it's here. So if if I write like p oops, uh, slash p, and I say hi, right, it should render. Hold on. Okay, uh, hold on. Uh, let me make sure my examples are right. Uh, I retrieved. Okay, yeah. So I should probably restart the server. <coughs> hmm. Okay, hold on. Technical difficulty. Let me. Okay, but but the idea remains. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the idea remains. Same thing. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why the high isn't rendering. I will have to check that out. Okay, but regardless, let's move on first. <clears throat> the next thing we want to do is we can. Okay, so this is the file that is in charge of the templates, right? So whatever we created is called a template. <clears throat> this is what is used to like map our template, like map the action to the template file. So we are just specifying that all of the templates can be found in this folder here that we added to. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is we want to now render our content. 
So the, the, the information is here for how to render. So I'll, I'll just follow along. I'll just copy it over. Right? Uh, basically, this is just HTML with a bit of unique syntax. <clears throat> the first thing we do is create a, a, a to-do, a div. Inside the div, we have a header. And then now you see this weird syntax where we basically look like we are calling Elixir, which we are. So what we are doing here is we are calling Elixir to retrieve the items of the to-do list that we passed to it, right? So remember, in the controller, we passed some to-do list here. We can access it in the page using the at, then the to-do, the variable name. And then we can just directly access the attribute. So like in, in the to-do list, there's a bunch of items. So the item has an is done. It has the title and it has the description. So that's how we, we render, right? So yeah, so if you are to copy the same code and paste it in, you will see this page render, right? So that should be relatively interesting because you don't, you don't actually have to do that much work to get the to-do list rendered, right? So that was about, I think, 10 minutes. But realistically, if you're doing this alone, you can probably do it in like three minutes or two minutes. So that is to kind of illustrate how streamlined the process is when writing it with uh, Phoenix as well. Okay? So after you have created a new page, um, if you're interested, we can actually do some styling. Uh, yeah, so I will just copy and paste the styling in a bit. But effectively, the next step we want to do is we can notice that we actually repeat this syntax a lot. Right? We repeat for every single item. We have to check if it's done. We then add the title, add the description. Um, if you have done React before, you will know that there's something called components. So we can effectively compose our page with these smaller units to render. So the next thing we want to do is go back to the HTML file we saw earlier. And then we can now create a functional component. So I gave more description to what a functional component is here. It's like way more detailed. But I will just be using whatever it was done here. So the idea is a functional component is just a function. So in Elixir, everything is a function. So I can define a function. And let's just call it to-do item. Right? The item needs to receive an assigns parameter. Whatever the assigns is, is basically whatever the, the the template gives to me. Okay? The next thing I want to do is write a squiggly line with a H and then triple quotes. Uh, this is a sigil. I, I think I explained a bit about it on top somewhere. Uh, but you don't have to know what it does. You just have to know it basically tells Elixir to treat this string slightly differently. It treats this string as though it's this, as, lo as though it's a HEEX file, which is basically like, uh, what's the equivalent? I think Ruby has its own, Django has its own. Basically, it's like a specialized HTML file that you can use to write Elixir in it as well. Okay? So I will just copy, I'll bring everything over into this string. So basically, I'm just saying this function here returns a, a component, a HTML component that has this behavior that, that basically renders this exact same items. Right? Um, for the sake of making it clearer, uh, I, will, I will wrap everything into a div. Okay, and you will see now I have to use it. So the way I can use it is I call dot to do item, and then I just pass in the item as a parameter, and then that should that should be it, right? So it's basically here, right? And then now you'll see there's another error, right? There's a there's a bit of like this is the dialyzer in work. It basically tells me oh there's actually an item that I'm trying to call but I don't know what the item is, so. Similar to how we reference the to-do, we can use the add symbol before the item to reference the add. And then we can just add adds everywhere. So effectively, what we've, what we've done is we've basically just brought what, um, we've basically just cleaned up the code a bit, right? We have basically moved this body over into, <clears throat> over into the functional component. OK? So if you go back to your page, you should see the page is still the same thing. Everything is still rendered correctly. OK? The next thing we can do is we can do a bit of styling. Um, I will just copy the styling because I don't think I, I, I have time to explain specifically how Tailwind does styling, but Elixir basically uses Tailwind. It's basically just adding new classes and styling it. Um, and then in the to-do items, we also want to style it. So I think the only thing I styled was this. Uh, give me a second. 
basically this, right? Uh, it's 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 all again in the in the documentation. So so do refer to it if necessary, right? Okay, so. Mm. Okay, yeah, so I'm not sure why it's doing on the same line, but it doesn't matter. And this is just the description. So if you, if you think the description is a bit annoying, you can just you can just delete it. It's not that important. So just just for the sake of it, so it's cleaner, we can do this. Okay? Um yeah, so so this is basically the fundamental way of creating a page and creating basically a a, a page, a static page for now for Elixir. Um then you might then ask yourself, how do I let people like mark the items in to-dos? How do I delete and add new to-do items, right? <clears throat> That's where we can add num some dynamic behavior. Um, I think because we have, yeah, so presumably you don't want to use JavaScript at all, right? So if you don't want to use JavaScript, you can actually do everything in Elixir. Um, so yeah, you, you can go further into the rabbit hole. So we can use what's called live view. Uh, I think I don't have that much time to cover all the details of it, um, but I'll try to cover as much as I can. Uh, the main idea for, for live view is it tries to basically flip the traditional request lifecycle on its head. So what I mean is, instead of doing like HTTP requests all the time and then HTTP response all the time, after one single HTTP request to retrieve the page, I establish what is called like a persistent connection with the server and client. So I can communicate subsequently with this connection. So I don't have to do any additional HTTP calls. Um, so what this means is everything we can, everything we do now can be done in Elixir. So all the communication, all the behavior can be implemented strictly with Elixir as well, which is quite, quite interesting. Uh, these are some of the important functions. I will di I'll dive into them uh, once we get to it. Um, for the sake of time, I won't explain how you can migrate what we have done so far into live view. It's not that difficult. Uh, I, I have a step-by-step -step here as well. So hopefully this is detailed enough for you guys to follow. <clears throat> um, but the main idea would be if you have pulled the repository, so the repository is here. So if, if you want to use, you can retrieve all the information here. You can do a clone, a change directory. You can set up the, the project. You can change to this branch called the live view base, and it should have done the migration for you. Okay. Um, I will, for the sake of time, go directly into our, uh, let's see, I'll go directly into our folder, and then I'll change, change to that branch to, to just demonstrate, okay? Okay, so it should be the same thing, right? Um, it's just slightly different in how I like, create the predefined to-do, um, but the folder structure, everything's the same, files are the same, um, but this time around, I've already migrated over to live view. Um, so if you looked at files like here, you'll see there is a new folder called slash live, right? Live is basically telling Phoenix that this is a live view file. Um, we have the live.ex, which is the controller file, same as just now. And then you have the HTML, uh, the HEEX file, which is the same as just now again. We have created a view, and then we have created our controller. Okay. Um, again, the full details are kind of covered more in depth in in the guide. Unfortunately, I don't have super a lot more time, so I won't try to dive into every detail possible. Um, but the idea is <clears throat> moving from base Phoenix over to Live View is quite straightforward and quite intuitive. And the other thing we changed was basically we changed from get to do to live to do. Okay. So this just tells Phoenix. This is a page that is live view rendered. Okay, so again, as I've said, live view basically establishes a permanent, a persistent connection between client and server. So now, every time I perform an action, it is basically done over on Elixir side. I don't have to call JavaScript. I don't have to call any weird front end languages. I can do it all within the back end. Okay, so, um, all right. So if we are to, let me just restart the server. Oops, wrong server. <clears throat> okay, so let me just run this server now. And then if I redo, so, so you see I have some initial items that I created, some buttons, some whatever, okay? So just to give a quick demonstration on how easy it is to basically create the action that the controller can do, that the view can call, so that there's some behavior in the back end, let's just create an action to create a new, uh, new task, right? So we want to create a new task. Um, let's 
first add a button. Oops, I forgot. Okay, so I will call this uh, form, right? So the reason I put it as a form is just so I can like use the buttons as buttons. So I can do like a submit button, right? Um, and then we can just say this is add, right? So we should see add button uh, for the sake of, let's just do this as green. Okay, yeah, so um, you should see this, this tiny button here called add, right? Um, if you're following along, you can just add whatever I've added. If not, I think the, the guide should contain more. Um, but basically now what we want to do is, every time I click this button, I want to basically add the item to my to-do list, okay? So I have about 10 minutes. So I will, just to demonstrate how intuitive it is, I will try to finish it in 10 minutes. I probably can do it in five, so hopefully it's possible. So the first thing I want to do is create what's called a binding. So a binding basically just says, on the front end, we have some behavior. We are doing a button click, we're doing a submit. On the back end, what is the action we are calling, right? So in this case, I say on submit, which is PHX, which is Phoenix submit. Let's just call this add to do, okay? So this is all we need to basically tell the front end, this view, to communicate with our server, the back end, okay? So as I've said, the backend is basically in an elixir as well. So if we go to the corresponding file, you will see that there is basically the same format. We just have like a new function called mount. The next thing I want to do is to create something called a handle event. And we can do pattern matching to find the event called add to do. So whenever the function is called, whenever handle event is called, as long as it's being called with the add to do event, right, which is what we declared here, we will run the body. Okay. The next thing we want to do is to retrieve the values of the form, which is the second parameter. And again, we can do, um, we can, let's see, we can give it a name, sorry. Let's say, let's call this title. So we can do pattern matching again. We can retrieve the title from the form. And then we can put it here. So we can say task, uh, task title, for example. And then the last one we have is the socket. So the socket is, as I've mentioned here, is the persistent connection. The socket just represents the persistent connection, okay? All right, so we have basically created our handler. So this is how we handle the action of submitting the form. Now, how do we exactly change and add the to-do, okay? So one way we can do it is if you go and look at the socket, what we actually want is to actually, we actually originally assigned the socket to have like the to-do item <clears throat> or the to-do property. So we can actually do pattern matching again, right? So, so this is where I, I've said, uh, pattern matching really shines in terms of like making things intuitive. I can literally do something like this and then assign socket, okay? So uh, just so it's readable, just to quickly recap, what I've done is basically created an action for adding a to-do. I have, the for the second parameter, I've retrieved the form input, which is the title. The second one is, I'm going into the socket, I'm looking at whatever I've assigned previously, which is the to-do list. I am going one, la one layer down and retrieving the specific items on the to-do list. And then after that, I'm still assigning the, va the value to socket. Okay, so hopefully, um, I think it won't be super clear if you just see it for the first time, but I think as you try to read the further examples, you'll kind of notice the same pattern, you'll notice how useful and powerful pattern matching is, okay? Then the next thing we want to do is now that we have our to-do list, we want to say new to-dos, right? Is we want to create a new to-do basically, right? So let's do an append. So we can do practical Elixir demo. We can say um, to-do to do item, right? Uh, let's just say that the title is the task title that was given to me, right? And I'm going to do a string, uh, not a string, a link, a list addition or list concatenation with the, with the existing to-do. So basically what this does is, I take the new to-do and I put it to the front of the list, right? And I'm assigning this new value to the new to-do's variable. Um, and then the next step, and all we have to do now is to call, is to return a tuple, no reply. It just says that there's no further actions to be done by the, by the client or the server. I call the assign method again. I pass in the socket. I give the to-do list and I return and I assign it to the new to-dos. 
that's it. So now if I go and oops, if I restart and I say hello world and I click add, you should see that now the action should have appeared and a new task should have appeared. Right? So that was about five minutes with explanation on how we can actually create um, basically a user interaction dynamic behavior from the front end with the back end. Right? And you can do everything entirely with Elixir. Um, for the sake of maybe demonstration, I will do let's see, you know, um, I'll just quickly add a add the behavior for marking a to-do item. So in this case, it will return i. ID is let's call this i. Uh, and in this case here, we can say like handle event. <coughs> Uh, mark as done, yeah. So, so in this case, maybe let's just say mark as done as the button. We have an action. On click, you want to do something. Um, when we click, let's say, for example, we'll just do like mark to do. And then we can just say like the value that it holds should be, I believe, like this, right? And then, again, same format. I can just do mark to do. I can retrieve the to-do item from the list, or from the, uh, from the parameters that I've given it. And then I can also retrieve the socket. So I can do the same thing here, basically. I can retrieve this item here. right? And then what I want to do is, basically, this behavior is super long. But yeah, so, so that's the general example of how I can like, create a new action from the, from the client. And after that, hook it up to a new behavior in the back end. I just have to create a new handle, uh, event handler, and after that, retrieve the information. OK? Yeah, so that's about it. Hopefully, it wasn't too confusing. Um, I know the last part is a bit more rushed. But again, if you're interested in finding out more, more details, more information, everything, please refer to the guide. Uh, this is basically just my brain dump. So hopefully, it's more useful. Um, and there's also more information on using like data for systems. Um, please, before you leave, fill out the feedback form, because uh, this is like a new topic that we are covering for Hacker School. So hopefully, your feedback can help to help us like, inform whether we want to increase or decrease the length of what, whatever section. OK? Yeah. I think there's nothing else after this, so it's just a feedback form. OK, new, new stop, right? Stop recording. Recording stopped.